Hello everybody. It's really lovely that you can be here with us this evening on this horrible, rainy London evening um, to do what we are here for here, which is to look at pictures and to think about the impact that pictures make on all of us, on our lives and what they tell us about the human condition. Um, and we're here tonight really to hear about this from Hisham Matar, um, the prize-winning author who needs, I think, no introduction at all in this audience, someone for whom the National Gallery has been absolutely entwined in your working, in your personal, in many aspects of your, of your life, mm. in all the time since you've lived and been part of life in London. Um, now, Hisham's novels and writings need no introduction again to you. Um, he, National Gallery paintings come up in so many of them, and we'll hear about this from Hisham this evening. But I particularly wanted to mention um, A Month in Siena, which you'll have the opportunity to purchase if you haven't already got it at the end of the evening. Um, a truly, truly wonderful um, and very, very, very um, thought-provoking book. Um, but with no further ado, I wanted to hand over to Hisham and just say what a pleasure it is to, to have you here with us tonight and to be able to think about what you think about when you look at paintings and how this feeds into your creative process. Uh, and I am delighted to be here and to be in conversation with you, Caroline. And uh, I was remembering on the way here a, a, an exhibit that uh, perhaps some of you have seen. I think it was 2006, uh, Bellini... Uh, and the East, it was called, and uh, how wonderful that was. Uh, and and uh, lovely to be in conversation with the person who curated it. Um, um, and uh, particularly uh, heartening to, to be in the National Gallery. I don't usually come in the National Gallery this way. This isn't how I <laughs> spend my time here. But it's a place that has been... Um, uh, a regular destination, a very uh, private, uh, regular destination for me uh, for the past 30 years. Um, uh, so it's a place that's very familiar. Uh, and uh, if I am, if, if you were to ask me, what is the one location in the world where you feel a great surge of excitement? Uh, and it's that second landing on the, on the old entrance, which is now the exit. Mm. You know, when you sit, stand there, mm. um, I, I always feel such a rush of enthusiasm. Um, so I, I think we, we're going to, we've sort of shaped this very loosely around yeah. a set of paintings. Yes. Um, the first one, um, I'm going to read a short passage from A Month in Siena to sort of uh, uh, introduce it. In 1990, when I was 19 and still at university in London, I had become mysteriously fascinated by the Sienese school of painting, which covered the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. I had lost my father that year. He had been living in Cairo in exile, and one afternoon he was kidnapped, bundled into an unmarked airplane, and flown back to Libya. He was imprisoned and gradually, like salt dissolving in water, was made to vanish. It was shortly after this that, for reasons that still remain unclear to me now, I began to visit the National Gallery in London every day during my lunch break and would stand in front of one, of, uh, in front of one painting for most of the hour. Every week, I would choose a different picture. Today, more than a quarter of a century later, having failed to find any trace of my father, I continue to look at paintings in this way, one at a time. I have found much profit in it. A picture changes as you look at it and changes in ways that are unexpected. I have discovered that a painting requires time. Now it takes me several months and more often than not, a year before I can move on. During that period, the picture becomes a mental or, as well as a physical location in my life. I was in the early stages of this habit when I encountered the Sienese paintings. 
At first, I did not know how to approach them. They seemed, in their often symmetrical structure and direct gaze, to be an affront, a confrontation. They were foreign in ways that other pictures I was interested in then, paintings by artists such as Velasquez, Manet, Titian, Cezanne, and Canaletto, were not. These pictures from the CNE school seemed instead to belong to a cloistered world of Christian codes and symbolism. I cannot say that they gave me pleasure. Yet I kept, almost against my own intentions, returning to them. I would often look quickly and pass. They left me feeling unprepared and in need of translation. They stood alone, neither Byzantine nor of the Renaissance, an anomaly between chapters, like the orchestra tuning its strings in the interval. This curiosity has deepened over the past two and a half decades. The colors, delicate patterns, and suspended drama of these pictures gradually became necessary to me every few months I go to the National Gallery in order to look once more at Duccio di Buenasenia's The Healing of the Man Born Blind. The seeing, who include Jesus, his audience, and the version of the blind man sedately occupy the lower half of the painting. They are, they are contrasted by the playful and brightly crisp activity in the upper half of the picture, where a hopscotch of arches and windows peering into empty spaces stare openly. They seem to be deliberately leading one's gaze away from the human activity below. It is in that direction, upward, that the second representation of the blind man, the one, the one still not healed, is facing. It is a painting that is questioning and ironic about what it might mean to truly see. It is not definite about the answer. It has always and throughout all the many years that I have been returning to the healing of the man born blind seems to be a space of doubt. Thank you very much. There is so much to think about in that passage and in how it applies to this particular picture. Mm. Um, how do you feel that the experience you have of renewed viewing, renewed engagement with this picture, does it change your mind about it? Or have these been the sentiments about it you felt since you started looking at it 30 years ago? I think both things happen at once. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like the nature of intimacy, I think. Mm -hmm. that the more that you get to know a place, um, I mean, on some level, Maybe the most mysterious place is my home, mm. you know, it's my rooms. Mm. You know, they're so familiar mm. to me, but they're also uncanny in some way, you know. Uh, and so I think something about the nature of intimacy involves this, intimacy with people and things that we find uh, uh, interesting. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you, you acquire more understanding, but you also acquire more questions about it. And it's mm. been that uh, with, with this painting. I mean, for example, yeah. the, 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 way that, um, the way that Christ uses his mm. finger to, mm. to heal the man's eye, mm. it's also a gesture of blinding as well, yeah. right? Mm. It's sort of, so, I, mm. so the, the painting is, um, is to me, it seems to me a, an excited space of contradictions, of mm -hmm. thinking, mm -hmm. you know. It isn't actually what it seemed right in the beginning, which is illustrative mm -hmm. of fact, mm -hmm. uh, illustrative mm -hmm. of an instruction. Uh, yeah. No, I think there's an element of questioning in this and in other paintings by Duccio. I mean, I, I love the fact that you, you know, you pick out that very, very weirdness that by putting the finger in the eye to heal, yeah. he is simultaneously also damaging the eye in a way. And yes. it makes you question what, what the sight is that yes. this man is, is, is getting back. Yes. What is this ability to see? Yes, yes, absolutely. 
And in the architecture of the painting, I don't know if that's an aspect that really fascinates you, this constant change between the open, the closed, um, or is it the figures that continue to excite you about the picture? Uh, it's both. I mean, in the sense he's mm -hmm. using architecture to, uh, to, to think about what it means to look out or mm. to look in mm. or to be um, observed. Because also, of course, the moment, I, I imagine, the moment uh, you begin to see, mm. the, if you've never seen before, mm. and then suddenly you learn how to see, mm. you're also being let into a very simple but unsettling fact, mm. which is that you are being seen. Mm. You know, it's yes. why I've always found it interesting how, how um, people that I've known who were born blind mm. seem to sort of lack a kind of self-consciousness about their body a bit, mm -hmm. which I, mm think very highly of, you know. Um, and, uh, and I think the moment you see, then really you are let into a whole lexicon of, mm. of what it means to, to be visible, mm. right? Mm. Um, so mm. I think the, the, the buildings are, are um, engaged in that, you mm. know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And what does the colour really do in this it picture? It delights me. Yeah. It really delights me. I think this is the other thing about these paintings. Yes that you know, they're filled with ideas. Mm. And they're also, they, I don't know um, how quickly they were done, but they feel like they've been done very quickly. <laughs> you know, they feel like, a, you know, very different, but like an Egmar Bergman film mm. that's done very quickly. And it's mm. part of the excitement, it's that it's done quickly. <laughs> um, you know, there isn't, you mm. know, there's something slightly, um, maybe naive about it on some level mm. that makes it uh, greater, mm. you know, more grand in some way. Mm. and also more available, mm. more playful to mess with it. You don't have to be an expert. I mm. like paintings that don't want mm. you to be an expert. Mm. No, it's, it's lovely you say this because, I mean, Ducho, the art is so radical, it's so amazing, mm. but it's probably one of the things that most visitors find most difficult yes. about coming to the National Gallery's collection. And yet, as you say, it's yeah. something which is so incredibly immediate. Maybe we have to lose the language of art history to talk about these things for them to once more become alive. And there are so many changes in this picture, yes. tiny, tiny changes, yes. which show the creative mind that mm. was, was, was producing it and was thinking yeah. as they as they made it. Yeah, t tell me, like what? Well, like for instance, tiny, tiny things, such as the man, the, the man, the blind man, when he's realizing his sight, yeah. there are all these changes to his shoulder. His position is moved somewhat. Yes. Um, he, the artist is thinking about this relationship because as he seems to be looking up in this moment of revelation, how is his body moving? Yeah. Is he happy about this, as you were saying? Yes. That's always a, something I've wondered too. He doesn't yeah. seem entirely delighted necessarily about this about this moment of revelation yes or at least not enthusiastic about the social consequences yes because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's turned away he's turned away yeah. and that gesture yeah. is could of course be a gesture of praise <laughs> yes but also could be a gesture of uh enough you know stay back there um so <laughs> <laughs> Tell me yeah. about the issue of intimacy, this, mm. this sense of mm. being, feeling that this is a very private space, but also a very public and difficult space too. That intimacy is, um, intimacy of course is wonderful, but it's also tricky. I think it's just oh. a, I mean, it's not a, 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 mm. a, a very uh, sophisticated thought, but it's just, it just always seems to me that there's an undertow mm. to intimacy that is very interesting. Mm. That the people uh, uh, that are most close to me, the people that I love and find mm. uh, uh, inexhaustible mm. in some way, are also the people that I know best. Mm. You know, um, and I've always found that very, mm. very interesting. Similarly, w works, you know, mm -hmm. books uh, that I reread or paintings mm. that I visit. Mm. It's also the sense of, of uh, they, they elude my command, mm. you know, all the time. Um, and, uh, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm grateful for it. I think to be uh, commanding uh, represents some problems, you know. Mm. Uh, it's not as vigorous mm. to me. I mean, mm. of course, you want to be commanding over certain things. You want to know how to brush your teeth. <laughs> you know? um, but, um, yeah. Anyway, shall, shall we move Elude, on to the next Eluding command is a lovely, lovely way of, of putting mm. it. Um, before we move on, could 
well, maybe this is something later, but you, you talked in that passage about how the picture is a mental as well as a physical space. Yes. How do you see that relationship between the mental and the physical when you come and look and relook at things like this? It, it just seems to me, I mean, it's sort of, pictures are, um, they're deceptive, aren't they? Mm. Because they're, they, they, they are, by, by definition, explicit. Mm. You know, they're there, they're mm. on a wall, mm. and they usually have a frame around them, or at least they, are, they do end at a, at a, at a boundary. Mm. And you could look at a picture very quickly. I mean, who's to say, if you stand in front of the picture, what's the average? There was a study, it was something it's like horrific. 43 seconds. No, or it's less than that. Is I'm it? afraid it is something like, um, it's about five seconds. Right. It's, it's absolutely yeah. extraordinary. And you, you stand in front of a picture, say, for five seconds, and you've seen it. I mean, mm. no one can say to you, you haven't seen it. <laughs> I have seen it. Um, <laughs> and actually, <laughs> And actually, it doesn't necessarily mean um, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you've stood in front of it for five minutes, you've seen it any better. I like to think so. The hopeful person in me likes to think so, but I'm uncertain about it. And so, uh, I think it's a, it becomes a mental space in the sense mm. that one of the one of the ways that it could do that is that exactly because it's explicit. Mm -hmm. And exactly because it's it's deceptive, isn't it? How you mm -hmm. know how to look at a painting? Nobody, I don't. Nobody has taught me how to look at a painting. I don't know. I mean, I remember my, you know, my best art history teacher at school, a wonderful uh, woman, who said, uh, just like between. I don't. I think she was thinking it. She wasn't really meant to say it. <laughs> she was like, you know, clicking to the next slide and looking up, and she said, you know, I've been looking at pictures all my life, and I still don't know how to do it. And I remember that was like a key. It was mm. open something for me. Mm. Um, and I mm. felt, OK, I don't need to be informed. Yeah. I can just have to make myself available. And when mm. you make yourself available, it sounds easy, but you know, uh, when you make yourself available to these paintings, you realize how they are spaces of immense concentration. Mm -hmm. There's so much um, thinking and Mm -hmm. psychology and emotional life and human history in them. Mm -hmm. So there are mental spaces in that way, mm -hmm. but also I think in a way that is harder to describe. I'm totally convinced of this, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to prove it. Is that I think paintings like this, mm -hmm. that have been on walls or in churches for a very long time, mm -hmm. but also I think contemporary paintings too, mm -hmm. th they're working all the time. This painting is working every day. It's on the wall doing its work every day. Mm. And each person that has ever stood in front of it has left something on it. In other words, the painting is mental space in the way that it also retains mm. all the gazes, mm. right? Mm. Um, and I also mean that in, in, in the sense that it also leaves a trace on our culture. Mm. It, you know, and that is easier to measure, isn't it? You can say, well, Duccio left a trace on our culture because of his effects on Simone Martini and, mm. and so on and so on. And you could make a line of mm. that. But I, but I also mean it in other ways, that it's a, it's a mental location. You know, it's a, um, and the other way that I mean it as a mental location is a place where you could really arrive mm. and deposit your curiosity. Mm. You could, it could be a space where you, where, where, that holds mm. your attention. Mm. And that's, um, there aren't a lot of those, you know, mm. that's a very rare occurrence. If you can find a space that holds your attention and invigorates it, you know. Mm. Because I do think that there's got to be a connection between attention, the quality of our attention, and, and questions of, of, um, of to what extent are we present or not, you mm. know, to what extent are we attending to things, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and that's why I think every act of cruelty that we commit or that anyone else commits demands uh, lack of attention. Mm. You have to somehow abstract somebody mm. or something mm. in order to cause damage onto it. You know, it's, mm. uh, um, it doesn't mean that if you give it your full attention, you're still, you, mm. that you'll be incapable of harm, but it mm. complicates it. So, mm. so it's a mental location in, in the sense that it's... Uh, it's not passive, you know, it's, mm. very, it's a very active space, I feel. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm, and it's a space where we're constantly interacting with those who have gone before us and those who will come after us as well too, in a, in a weird sort of way. Um, these objects, like great literature yeah. they're, they're, or great music, they're connectors. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, uh, and um, you know, I'm all for learning, of course, mm. but, uh, but I don't think it's a prerequisite to arrive. You know, arrive at the painting with all that you've got, because mm. you also have traces of human history in you, mm. whether you know it or not. And then the painting or the piece of music then mm. becomes the source that drives you, if, if they, if they mm. do work on you, drive you to learn about them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And never look at the label. Why? Well, because it doesn't generally help yeah. you. Yeah. Well, sometimes they're very well written. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think maybe we should get we should we should be involving different people in doing them. I, I do think that the, the number of vo the, vo the voice that a text imposes on something yes. makes it difficult to be able to look at it yes. in this in this broader in this broader way. Yeah. Yeah. But we could probably spend at least an hour talking about the Duccio, but there are other pictures which you, we want to reflect on too, yes. which you particularly yeah. want to reflect on. Yeah. Um, although the next picture um, is in many ways such a, such a departure from, from this, certainly in terms of the, of the, of the art history, but mm. not in terms of, of your relationship with it and what it's meant to you and for your life and for your work. Yes. Yeah. Would you say that these two pictures are really key for how you've, how you've been thinking? Um, they're certainly part of a group of pictures mm -hmm. that, are, mm -hmm. that uh, I've had a very unlikely, what seems to me from here, a very unlikely um, sort of... Um, uh, um, you know, um, engagement with them. Mm. Uh, mm. In this next one, mm. in, a, in a very bizarre um, um, uh, chance. Mm. Uh, in fact, so unlikely that when I came to write about it, I thought, I've got to really think carefully about how to mm. write this because it's so unlikely that it might mm. not uh, work. Mm. You know. I have always wondered if it is possible to lose your father without, seeing the, without sensing the particular moment of his death. I recall an interview on the radio with a Syrian poet whose name I have forgotten. He came to London to give a reading. He was staying at a hotel off Grosvenor Square. One afternoon, he felt the compulsion to go out into the square. I walked under the trees, he said. It was a beautiful day but I could not get rid of a desperate sadness. I longed for my mother. When I returned to my room, I found a message telling me that she had just passed away. I remember hearing that on the radio and thinking, it makes perfect sense. Of course, I told myself, it would be impossible that I should fail to detect the moment when someone I love dies. And this thought often comforted me, particularly when hope was thin. And now that it is unimaginable, that my father is alive, I am unsettled by the failure. So much happens in this world without us blinking. Most likely, father was killed in the massacre at Abu Slim prison. Several of the prisoners had told me that, although they did not see him. They had heard from others that Jabal Matar was amongst those who were brought into the courtyard that day. The poet, Ehlayil Biju, who was a prisoner at Abu Slim at the same time, was taken aback by the fact that I even doubted it. But then when I asked him if he or anyone he knew saw my father that day, he said, no. And then added, but it's obvious. Another prisoner who was in a cell facing the passage into the courtyard told me, I can almost swear I saw him, but I can't be certain because the light was, wasn't good. It was very early in the morning. It is possible that such accounts were made deliberately ambiguous in order to soften the blow. So, although it has never been confirmed, the most probable day of my father's life, uh, the most probable day my father's life ended was the 29th of June, 1996. 
when he was 57 and I was 25. Throughout all the years, all the searching and investigating I had done, I had never looked at my diary from that year. I'm not a regular diarist. There are years when I have made only a handful of entries. Recently, on returning from seeing the Titian exhibition in Rome, I searched my notebooks and found the one from 1996. And there it was, an entry made on the 29th of June, the day of the massacre. It was a Saturday. I was living in the West End, some 20 minutes walk from the National Gallery, and poor. For weeks, all I ate was rice and lentils. I was always terribly anxious about money. Worry was like acid in the waking hours. But I looked as smart as I could and made a rule of not telling anyone how desperate I was. The entry reads, could not get out of bed till noon, walked to NG, done with the Velasquez, I've switched to Manet's Maximilian. Never speak about money troubles again. Tomorrow, draw. The following day, there's another entry, one line. Didn't draw. I read them again. There was something dizzying about the distance. I had obviously broken my rule, been complaining the night before about money, but that alone cannot explain why, being the early riser I usually am, I could not get out of bed till noon. Most of all, what sent a shiver through me was the fact that on the day 1,270 men were executed in the prison where my father was held, I chose to switch my vigil, which by then I had been keeping for six years, to Edward Manet's The Execution of Maximilian, a picture of a political execution. The 17th century Spanish painter Diego Velasquez who had a hold on me during those years, is counted amongst the influences of the French painter Manet. It was probably this chronology of influences that had organized my decision. Nonetheless, it is unsettlingly appropriate. Manet was responding to one of the most controversial political events of his time. The French intervention in Mexico had come to a disastrous end with the execution of their installed ruler, Emperor Maximilian, in 1867. There were no photographs of the incident, of course. Manny had to rely on the stories he heard and the accounts he read in the papers. In the same year, he began work on several imaginings of the event. Over the next couple of years, he was to complete three large paintings, an oil sketch and a lithograph depicting the fall of Maximilian. They are scattered around the world. The one at the National Gallery happens to be the most poignant, not least of all because after the artist's death, the painting was cut up and sold in fragments. The impressionist artist Edgar Dega purchased the surviving pieces and it was not until 1992, two years after my father's disappearance, that the National Gallery assembled them on a single canvas. Large chunks of the picture remain missing. You cannot see Maximilian, only his hand gripped tightly by one of his generals. The firing squad is as ruthlessly focused and indifferent as the men surrounding St. Lawrence in the Titian painting. It would be hard to think of a painting that better evokes the inconclusive fate of my father and the men who died in Abu Slim. Learning of the fact that my unknowing 25-year-old self was guided, whether by reason or instinct, to this picture on the same day as the massacre unnerved me and has since changed my relationship to all the works of this French artist, who somewhere in Proust's novel is described as the painter of countless portraits of vanished models models who already belonged to oblivion or to history. Today, whenever I see a Manet, the white, his white, which is unlike any other white, cannot be a cloud, a tablecloth, or a woman's dress,
but will always remain the white leather belts of the firing squad in the execution of Maximilian. When I first read this passage some years ago, I was just so struck by the contained anger, which is completely not surprising, but also how you had so amazingly wondered to collect your thoughts and to produce a passage which, for everything that it contains, is so unbelievably measured. It sounds like you're actually calm, but there was no calmness in the, mm. in the, in the way that this picture enabled mm. you mm. to channel your thinking. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm pleased you, you say that, because mm. to me, one of the things that I'm interested in uh, and was interested in in, in The Return, um, the book that this mm. passage comes mm. from, is to create a, um, a, a situation uh, for emergence, mm. you know, for things to come up. Um, mm. um, and, um, and I found out something really quite interesting, mm. that if I were to apply, uh, the book involves, as this passage illustrates, involves uh, um, uh, me having to think carefully mm. about things that I would rather not think about, mm. and think about them with a certain level of uh, rigor and uh, curiosity mm. about things that make me very impatient. Mm. Um, but I found that if you apply a certain lens to them mm. that was um, uh, that was that, that was curious beyond you know within and beyond the boundaries of your own fascination with them, mm. that if you could find a way that you could somehow rewire them. Mm. or plug them into a vaster sort of mm. substrata mm. Of, of human thoughts and mm. uh, to understand them in the context of that distance. You know? mm. um, and uh, to do it with something that's, um, I don't know how else to describe it, but a sort of, a sort of fierce tenderness, you know, mm -hmm. where you are, you are not going in with a, with a knife. You are just attending and waiting and being very patient. Mm. And I found if you do that long enough, if you could bear it long enough, mm. it starts to open up. Mm. The material starts to open up and becomes mm. really fascinating. Mm. So it was a schizophrenic exercise because the person was saying, you've got to be kidding. I want to, <laughs> come on. <laughs> of course I don't want to do that. Mm. Uh, but the writer was having a ball, you know, having a great time. <laughs> Because, uh, because he's uh, trying to mm. access this material, mm. you know, so, and that was such a, you know, mm. if I stayed in that space mm. of, of fierce tenderness and curiosity, mm -hmm. I, I um, could uh, uh, not always succeed, but I could create the conditions for this state of emergence, you know, mm. Um, mm. you know, and, um, you know, a state of emergence, uh, Benny and Walter, um, the um, rights, you know, is also, you know, that's what, what a state of emergency is also. Mm. You know, a state of emergency mm. is when things, mm. um, so it's very, very uh, urgent and uncomfortable, mm. but very interesting, you mm. know, really interesting. Mm. And in that way, some people say, do you feel better now? Americans love that question. <laughs> do you feel better now that you've written this book? You know, it's the wrong question for many yeah. reasons, but, mm. but if there's anything that does mm. feel better, Mm. is that it is almost the opposite of impotence, that moment. Mm. That moment when things start to come mm. up, is you feel, mm. you know, uh, that you're not being, you know, as this fate sometimes makes you feel, mm. you know, people disappear, you can't go back, mm. things are cut off, and mm. violence, and people you know who are in prison, and mm. other things that I don't even mention here, you know, people mm. that I've lost, or who have been damaged, or, mm. you know, it does work. Mm. Political oppression works, this is the worst thing about it, it really does work, you know. Mm. Uh, it leaves, in other words, you know, damage behind it. Mm. Um, and, and that often feels as if you're being submerged, you know, mm. by history. You're being pushed mm. yeah. down. And, and so, in, so if there is a constellation, it's, a, it's that momentary constellation of, of bringing things up to the surface and bringing them up to the surface not for your own benefit, not so you can mm. feel better <laughs> mm. or, uh, or to, uh, to push uh, 
uh, a doctrine or a, or a message or something, but so as to, to, to contribute as modestly as possible into that wonderful uh, exchange that we feel. You know, this is the strangest <laughs> thing about these solitary arts, mm. Mm. you know. You have to be alone to paint, you have to be alone to write. Mm. Most people do at least. Mm. Um, yet the real pleasure in them is mm. a very communal pr pleasure. You know, the moments mm. that when we are reading and we are really mm. uh, enlivened is when we find ourselves in these mm. pages, right? Mm. Um, so um, so that, that's, yeah, that's what... Uh, and there's the incredible strangeness that if you have this sort of experience with a work of art, you are doing it. It's an internal process, but you're doing it in a very, very, very public space. Mm. You're doing it in a space that, like you, anybody in the world can turn up in in those hours yes. and look at. Yes, absolutely. How do you feel about that? that that, that relationship between the public and the private that you get when looking at art in, in public galleries? I think it's so uh, important. I mean, we were mm. speaking earlier about our shared passion for uh, free access to, mm. to museums because it really does change things. You know, you, um, you know, even if you had to come in and sign Right to just say, can I be exempt from paying because I'm a student, or because mm. you, even if you had to do that, you probably wouldn't because, or not as often. There is something wonderful about walking in and having it all available, and it's also wonderful to have it filled with people like you who have mm. just come either intentionally or, as often happens, have just found themselves there somehow. Mm. You know, mm. and um, and uh, you know, as much as I, I, I really. I'm really on the side of people, you know. I like, I, I like with, uh, notwithstanding everything that has happened, I like people. Um, and I am a social person, mm. I, I like to engage with people. Mm. But I, uh, I also enjoy the fact that I could um, leave my writing desk, mm. uh, walk to the bus station, mm. get on the bus, arrive at Trafalgar Square, walk in, having not needed to speak to anyone, <laughs> right? And I walk in and I walk through, nobody asks me mm. any questions. Mm. And I go to the painting that I've been looking at and it's mm. as if that painting is in my room mm. or it's as if my room is here. Mm. You know, it collapses the distances mm. and in a very subtle way infects you with this optimistic feeling that these things are very truly ours in some mm. way which they've always seen to me. Mm. Culture is, is, uh, is open. And for me, I mean, if you come from, you know, the former colonies, mm. or you, it's very easy for you to fall in the trap of thinking this is not mine. This mm. belongs to the oppressor, to the West, mm. to, you know? Yes. All of these complicated and oftentimes legitimate sort mm. of traps that you could fall mm. into. Um, and so I, I've always loved the, 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 you know, to, to foster in me and, and in my students and mm. others the, the feeling that, uh, which seems to me bluntly uh, mm. true to be the mm. case, that all of this belongs to us, all mm. of it, you know. Mm. You know, children and the very elderly don't look alike all over the world for no reason, you know. <laughs> There's <it's> something <laughs> about us being uh, very connected in some way. And mm. so, um, so I, you know, the, 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 the public availability of these paintings mm. uh, uh, adds to, to, to the pleasure. It's not mm. that I am beyond the greed of wanting to own this, have it in my well, room. Well, yes, because the painter but, Doga yeah. owned this and he well, coveted the bits right. and he collected them together. Yes, I'm not beyond that greed. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I am far more excited mm. that it's... Mm. Um, mm. That, mm. that, that, it's, uh, that it's available to mm -hmm. us in this way, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. And, uh, and that when, in the times, of course, I can't, um, I've got very mm. limited mm. Uh, um, uh, focus. Mm. <laughs> and mm. so in the time I'm not interested in the execution mm. of Maximilian, so many mm. other people are, are at the same, and in the times that I am interested in it, the interests of others are helping me, mm. you know? So I think that's mm. a, very, a very special, mm. Uh, thing that, mm. yeah. But I, once I once I read that passage in the return, I will never not think about Manet's white, except in the relationship 
to the belts yes. of the, yeah. you know, this is this is the thing. By 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 writing and expressing these things, you you put across powerful <coughs> associations and thoughts that again have right. that work, like the painting, of connecting so many people to it in in, in different ways. Yes, yes, and you can see it actually. The mm. white is also, mm. uh, of course, the shirt mm. of the, mm. of, but the way he mixes the clouds with the smoke, yes. the guns, the yes, it's. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and the distractedness and somebody mm. sort of yeah. absent-minded there. Mm. Uh, it's, mm. it's a very clever picture. And I, I, over time, these gaps have become very interesting to me. You know, in, 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 what, in what way exactly? I mean, because they you wonder what's going to be there, but you sort of know because the other versions, or how are they interesting to you? I mean, they, they, in the beginning, maybe the first um, five minutes mm -hmm. I looked at it, mm -hmm. ever, Mm. I thought, oh, I wonder what's here, what was missing. Mm. Mm. After that, I just took it for granted, this is how the painting is. Mm. These gaps are deliberate. Mm. Of course, they're not. Mm. But they're, they, they have come to be uh, a very interesting element of the painting. Mm. I mean, if it, you know, um, and, and, and in the sense that I think one of the things that paintings often do, uh, paintings like this, is that mm. they, they engage you in... Um, in, in uh, Finishing them, mm. you know, great yeah. books do that too. They yes. get, you have to finish the book with mm. the authors. The, the, mm. uh, these are incomplete works; they will always mm. be incomplete. Mm. Um, and uh, and and I think great paintings have the have the character of creating space for you to mm. enter mm. and to to complete them. Mm. This, of course, is a very extreme version, you know, because it's done by history and by violence but violence to the painting. Violence to the painting, yeah. but in a sense that's amazing too because part of the history of the object ends up informing the, his, you know, the way in which we, 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 we think about it yes. as well. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah. one of the things I find so extraordinary thinking about violence in this picture is that it was bought for the British, for the, for the National Gallery, yeah. at a time when Paris was being attacked. Um, Minard Keynes, who was apparently sitting in the sale room, um, recounts that he could hear the bombardment of Paris going on oh. overhead. And huh. then he ends with the picture being trundled back from Charing Cross Station on some great sort of trolley across to the National Gallery. So the, the, huh. the relationship of the picture's history with war is yeah. also very paramount. And I wonder, what, um, why was it that it was in 92 that it was put together? Well, um, it was, I think, it was because I was also a student in London at this time, yes. and I remember seeing yeah. the, the exhibition. It was the first exhibition I ever saw, actually, of the execution really? of Maximilian yeah. of the yeah. four versions. And I think it was, it was, put, it was brought back together for, for that. Right. But, yeah, yeah. using the yeah. canvas that Duga had actually had, had put it on, yes. I understand. Oh, really? Yeah, so oh. it was an act of physical oh. um, restitution, not just of what Manet's intentions were, but mm. what Dugas' intentions had been mm. as well. Mm. As you suspected, Hisham, we've spent the entire time talking yes, about two we have, pictures. We have about five, we have about five, five or six or, other yes, pictures. Exactly. But, um, we, we but, should, it, but, but, but I think that, that is really what is so interesting about about your work and its relationship to paintings, that it's mm. about this question of immersion. And I wondered if we might bring this conclusion, this, this conversation to, it, to a slight end by, by talking a little bit about what immersion in a painting means to you. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think I'm, if I understand immersion correctly, I think I'm maybe, uh, it's not so much immersion that happens. Mm -hmm. It's more these um, periodic encounters mm -hmm. because I like what happens between the encounters. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like mm -hmm. the, 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 the painting when you're standing in front of yeah. it is curating your thoughts a bit mm -hmm. or at least engaging with you in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of those really wonderful conversations mm. that are unpredictable, mm. and yet very concentrated mm. and, um, and uh, fluent, you know, mm. uh, and coherent, and, um, or incoherent in ways that are suggestive of coherence, mm. right, something beyond them. And, 
and then when you go away, you forget about it. Mm. Uh, and you, things happen in that week. You do work, you listen to a piece of music, you talk to mm. someone, you see something else. Mm. And the painting is somehow a distant re reference. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you go back to it, you bring to it everything that has happened. Now, mm. if you do that over a period of a year, mm. um, you realize that everything that you bring to it mm -hmm. is, um, is either a source of excitement, you know, that it opens up new angles to it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or, uh, or, 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 or not. And I find actually it's very similar in reading, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in that you're, 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 uh, a text that you're reading parallels your time, doesn't it, in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. And also it affects the quality of, your, of, your, of the silence. It's as if every painting has its own tune, its own, um, its own register of silence. Uh, silence is maybe the wrong word, maybe stillness or being, you know, mm. with it. Just like I think the people that we know, mm. and you know that when you're with someone, uh, think of somebody, I don't know, your friend or your mother, mm. you see you're sitting with your mother and she's quiet. It's a very particular science, silence mm. than when you are with one of your friends. So I think these qualities of stillness or silences mm. change all the time. Uh, mm. Something I'm very interested in in prose, you know. Mm. Um, um, but I think it also works, it's also the case with paintings, you know. Mm. That the painter is painting a visual world, but they're also creating a mental uh, state, you know. Mm. Uh, mm. Mm. Well, I think you remind us so much of the fact that looking and looking at a picture is never a pacific experience. Mm. Um, you were yeah. looking, but you were also taking, and there's that give and take with the object as well too. It depends so much on your circumstances, um, yeah. of those people who are with you, and it changes all the time, that, yes. that, that relationship. It's never static. Yes. Absolutely. Even if there are things you come back to for reasons of comfort or pleasure yeah. or relief, it's never the same experience. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's why a lot of paintings, I mean, some of the paintings that we were going to talk mm -hmm. about are to do with interiority, you know, to do with a room or something. Mm. Because mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's also understanding that the most dramatic things happen in rooms, mm. don't they, in very private rooms. But also that the painting, I think, I think Vermeer on some level painted a lot of things in rooms because he was excited by the idea that a I painting... said Vermeer, we can't, I can't resist going to yeah. it, <laughs> at least for yeah. a little bit. Yeah, that, 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 that a painting yeah. can be a room, Yes. right? I mean, in, you know, in, mm. in the sense that it can be a location that, mm. like a room, you know, and we know from being in different rooms, mm. that we know some rooms excite different thoughts or different mm. behavior. Mm. Some rooms make us gloomy, some rooms make us mm. more optimistic or more playful, some rooms make us more serious. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, so I, I, I've always thought that was interesting. The other reason mm. I think mm. this is very interesting is the, is the wall, you know, mm. that there's this, just this incredible uh, um, emotion and, mm. you know, uh, activity in a flat wall. Mm. It's amazing. And he's very good at that. He's fantastic yeah. at it. Yeah. I think I could spend a lot of time looking at the dirty walls in 17th century paintings yes. in him and Peter de Hoek. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Yes. The perfect spaces that are never perfect. Yes, absolutely. Mm. But there's a passage actually in, in, in I think it's uh, the translation in English is The mm. Captive. I think it's mm. the penultimate volume in, mm. in Proust's In Search mm. of Lost Time where mm. he does talk about a character who's dying mm. in a gallery. Mm. Uh, um, and uh, and is looking at a painting mm. by Vermeer, mm. and he's looking at the wall of the painting, mm. and it's a yellow wall, mm. and he doesn't understand how do you do. I mean, how can you paint a wall with so much feeling, so much mm. uh, emotional life in them? How, and what what are the prerequisites, <laughs> right? Which is a, a question about you know what do you need to make art yeah. in a sense, mm. and and Proust posits the, his trilogy, you know, mm. the trinity rather, mm. uh, which is um, uh, kindness, mm. scrupulosity, and self-sacrifice. Mm. A very interesting, mm. <laughs> mm. Um, you know, uh, proposition, mm. really interesting. Mm. Yeah. And kindness, I think, maybe we should think of it in both the, the, the sense of of a kind, mm. uh, you know, in, mm. in, the, in the way Shakespeare would have meant it, you know, mm. the sort of 
as a copy of something mm -hmm. or a representation of something. But I think maybe also kindness in, in, in the sense of, of, of compassion. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the need that you have to lend yourself, mm -hmm. your imagination, your attention, what we were talking about mm -hmm. before, to the thing, even, even, mm -hmm. in, you know, even if you're going to write or paint a scene of an execution, mm -hmm. you have to be the executed in the execution. You have to be all mm. of those people, you know? Mm. So kindness in that sense and the ability mm. to to um, to feel deeply uh, you know, mm. for, for, for those moments. Mm. And yeah. to inhabit it in a sense. Yes. Um, that enables yeah. other people to inhabit it with you. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's mm. why propaganda is a problem mm. when it comes mm. into art because it's it's not only a problem um, um, you know you can make an argument about it uh, against it rather mm. uh, politically or even mm. morally or ethically. But I think it's also a problem aesthetically because it becomes, it's a reduction of mm. the possibilities. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of these paintings, you get the sense that the painter is, hasn't figured it out quite. Mm. They're using the painting to think, mm. to, to posit. You know, mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Mercifully, most propaganda is extremely bad art. Um, but I think to end at this moment thinking about the possibility of the work as something that enables you to think, mm. that enables us all to think in how we listen to you, think about what the pictures mean to you, um, and also to bring back to what you talked about at the beginning, about that the art of seeing is not necessarily the art of believing. Um, yes. That the worlds that are created here are not intended to be perfect, they're not intended to be finished, yes. and our role as the viewer is almost to become part of them yes. and inhabit them ourselves. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're waiting. Mm. For engagement. Mm. Yeah. In fact, they're waiting so much that we should stop and encourage you to go up and start that dialogue. You have another hour and a half before the gallery closes this yes. evening to, to do it. Um, thank you very, very much, oh, Hisham, pleasure. for a really wonderful conversation. What a privilege to have you sitting here you with so us much. and talking about National Gallery Pictures. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.